Hello, everyone. Um, today, we're going to have a conversation about multimodal qualitative research with a focus on visual methods. And I'm joined here today by Dr. Sharon Ravitch and Dr. Jane Shore, who are going to share uh, some interesting perspectives from their work. But before we get started, in case you are new to method space, I want to just uh, give a brief overview because this is a blog community sponsored by Sage Publications, where we focus on all things to do with research design, the conduct and analysis of research, as well as writing about it and sharing results in both conventional and new ways. And at the heart of this Venn diagram, you see teaching and learning because we're committed to uh, helping to guide and provide resources that will help um, student and novice researchers and experienced researchers who want to learn something new. So uh, we hope that uh, that will be uh, the case for you today. So um, Sharon, why don't you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, hello, Janet, it's a delight to be here. And my name is Sharon Ravitch. I'm faculty at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a, quality, I'm a career qualitative researcher. I teach qualitative research and I design um, and guide uh, doctoral students, master's students and, and colleagues through how to design and engage multimodal research that matches the goals of what they're seeking to do with their studies. Great. Well, you you cover kind of all of the bases of the interests that we have here uh, at Method Space. So, Jane, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jane Shore, and uh, I serve as the head of research and innovation. Uh, for a new school and a um, professional community called the School of Thought. Um, and my role, and I'm gonna steal this because Sharon introduced herself a while back as a corner sitter, and I'm actually right now sitting in a corner. Um, and um, I, I think about that because I think my role for the last 15 or 20 years has really been in that translation space between mm -hmm. research and practice in education, that corner and that intersection between the, the theory and, and bringing the theory to the ground. And um, I've been conducting and part of teams that conduct qualitative and quantitative research, um, but really sit in that intersection of translation. Right, so which fits very well with our, you know, interest in new ways to share results that will really create uh, impact and, and understanding of research. And I think that's at the heart of what we want to talk about today. So in case you haven't heard the term multimodal or sometimes called multi-method research, essentially um, this, these are studies that use more than one approach for data collection or analysis within the same paradigm. So in mixed methods research, we draw from qualitative plus quantitative. So here we're talking about using more than one type of qualitative uh, data collection, in particular uh, today, um, in the same study. So for example, we might mix interviews or focus groups with observations. Uh, we might incorporate uh, archival extant uh, data or diary methods, you know, other kinds of uh, approaches for data collection that also uh, generate a variety of types of data. So what we're uh, going to talk with you about today is the ways to integrate visuals into that mix. Is there anything that you want to uh, add before we go on? Uh, one of the things that I'd like to say and why I'm so excited about my partnership with, with Jane, I was going to say Dr. Shore, but I'll call her Jane for this interview, um, is that to me, the visual articulation of meaning mm. can happen as a part of the research design and process itself, like mm -hmm. participatory methods that really are democratizing. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I just do want to say that 
I see visuals as something that can help in the telling of the stories and the mm -hmm. findings of the research. I also think visuals are very generative within the research itself. Right. And Jane has really helped me think about the ways that we can democratize um, through using multimodal research and particularly within that, really focusing in on how to visualize as a part of the research process and product. Right, right. And, yeah, just and I think, you know, it, as you say, like within the research, sometimes if we're collaborating with other researchers, uh, we're, you know, working across uh, disciplines, creating some visual representations of our designs can, you know, help uh, everyone, you know, be on the same page. Jane, what were you going to say? And then, then please just take over and, and describe this uh, graphic we have in front of us. Sure, I like how we're building because I, I, what you said just added to what I was about to say. Um, I think that part of what we see as the opportunity and as I've been had the opportunity to work with Sharon on this is really the idea that um, visuals help you think in ways that you mm -hmm. might not have been thinking and they afford opportunities to translate across settings. So the thinking is expanded and your circle of conversation is also expanded, the individuals you're able to communicate with. Right. Um, and, and that actually brings us to this uh, circle, the golden circle of data visualization. This is um, a visual that was inspired by Simon Sinek's work on the golden circle, which is really a, um, a process that's, that's used by many businesses to, to sort of um, get at their why in organizational development and business development, but translated to this idea of visualization as a means for communication. Mm -hmm. And the, the framework that Simon Sinek uses in centering the conversation and beginning with the why is really useful, especially for visualization in research. Um, one of the things that I think we've been thinking about a lot is, is the why and what it brings. And there are several things, and there's a lot of work behind this. What Sharon had been saying before about inclusivity, I think, is one of the most important. There's an equity in the use of visuals. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about lately is that as we have this textual bias, we tend to have a textual bias in research. When we think about text, text is very sequential. When you look mm -hmm. at visuals, mm -hmm. they are not sequential. They don't need to be sequential. We can organize them in sequential ways, but a visual allows you to see information through a different lens and different perspective. And it, so it allows for inclusivity, not just across settings and temporal periods of before, during, and after research, but also includes that sense of um, language translation and a, a, a way to gain a story at one time. So mm -hmm. I think inclusivity is a really big reason for the use of visuals um, to provide access. They also um, incorporate emotion and um, there's been a lot of research. There's a neuroeconomist that has studied this that we looked into um, and um, he has um, I'm blanking on his name. His name is Paul Zak. Um, he has found that the use of visuals in, um, in behavioral economics is associated with action. So not only is it inclusive and evoking of emotion, but also builds our behavior change in ways that um, words alone might not. And, and finally, I, I really sit in this place about uh, learning durability, you know, if we want to um, ensure that information is processed by a variety of different learners in a variety of different ways, visuals allow our processing to happen in different parts of our brain. And that ability to move to visual spatial from the verbal linguistic in different areas of our brain means that the memories can be more durable, rooted in more places. So a, a wider area um, of memory is formed. So the, this visual, I, I stick with the why, 
you know, um, there are a lot of other um, uh, reasons that visuals are really um, a way to translate and make um, research more accessible, but it really is rooted in the why. So move, move on to this one. If once we've thought about the why, then this might help to guide us about creating visuals that will help us to achieve the kinds of uh, assets that you've described. Sure. So um, when we move from the why, you know, this, this visual is really about the how. So if you're, if you're thinking, well, there's a reason, there's a reason, there's a, um, there's a big idea behind the use of visuals, but then how do I do this? And how do you make decisions about visuals? And I think you have to start with the subject first. You have to start with the data you have mm -hmm. and what the information is that you want to get across. So there are a lot of different ways you can do that. Some of them, the more traditional ways can be really powerful. Um, this graphic was created to imagine that there are many different um, translations of research that can turn into visuals, whether they're mm -hmm. evidence and data driven or they're theoretical and story driven. The classic visuals sit in the upper right quadrant, thinking about um, the, um, the, the sort of so what, and you have bar graphs and you might have, mm -hmm. so these are the places where you think about cause and effect, you might have a timeline, but the other vis there are also other visuals that might not be as the, sit in that traditional quadrant where you're creating a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are the visuals that really allow for a story to be told, where you might be inviting mm -hmm. co-creators into the conversation by presenting an idea or a theory or a way, a network that might work in ideas. And um, some of these might be freer forms so that they exist in that exploratory phase, that phase where you're questioning, you're developing, you're co-creating with individuals that are participating in the research. Great, okay. So Sharon, how, how does all of this uh, add into these kind of new ideas about how to proceed with multimodal qualitative research? Great question. And at a great moment, right, as we're also thinking about this COVID-19, everything is right now online and folks are thinking about pivoting or shifting data collection or developing data collections. I really feel like Jane's, um, Jane's conceptions and the idea that you that that visuals are generative, right? Language generates meaning, visuals generate meaning. And so creating structures and processes for collaborative research, whether you're researching, you're a lone researcher, you're in a group, mm -hmm. how do you have what Nicole Carl and I in our book Qualitative Research talk about as dialogic engagement partners? People mm -hmm. who you can really have as thought partners throughout your research. And what I've found um, since working with Jane is that really things that you might think you had shared understanding of because there were words on a page, when suddenly you're interpreting mm -hmm. visuals together, you realize maybe people aren't tracking on the same meaning of something, mm -hmm. even more so across countries with different languages. Um, I've found and and as well within that doing participatory work in places where you often have a number of people in the same place who speak different dialects of the same language, such as a lot of my work in India, for example, where in in Mumbai people speak both Marathi, Hindi, um, and and also English and Urdu, right? So there are ways that these visuals really can help aid the process and then also the pros the product of um, more equitable and critically inclusive uh, representation, which is something that I think a lot about in, in my broader work and certainly in my research. So in terms of this visual, this visual actually came out of a conversation that the three of us had thinking about this current conversation. And we talked about research literacies broadly and then specifically in this COVID-19 moment. And so I want to begin, since we have been talking primarily about mixed methods and multimodal research with that, right, that in fact, a research literacy is to understand that your methods and your design map onto your research questions and the goals of your research. 
And so thinking about the ways that we have multiple data sources in qualitative research and perhaps multiple media or mediums, media of those, um, right? So we can have priority rankings and we can have surveys and we can have observation of naturally occurring groups online and we can have interview trans, right? So there are these whole data sets that are what we think of as triangulated for validity, right? Multiple data sets can help with validity. And also it can help with democratizing a process um, and really thinking about what range and variation of methods and modalities can help us to generate with the participants of our studies the data we need to really be able mm -hmm. to answer our research questions with complexity and texture. So mixed methods and multimodal, for me, they are a literacy and they are a literacy of responsive methodology. Right, that we don't just say, well, I do qualitative or I do quantitative or I just do text based, right? That we think more broadly about the possibilities mm -hmm. for ourselves and each other and the ways that research can um, can reinvent itself in this moment and then ongoingly. And so a piece of that is this notion of emergent design research, which really one might argue that all qualitative one would i would argue that all qualitative research is on a continuum of being emergent design right where fidelity is about being responsive to participants um in large part and so but but particularly emergent design that's more along the lines of truly emergent as you're going right so practitioner research or action research or participatory action mm -hmm. research um you know ethnography these are modes of research that can be Com almost completely emergent design. And in these moments, a lot of people are finding that a lot of these participatory methods that they use, again, like priority mm -hmm. rankings or different kinds of visual group processes um, can really be done online tremendously well. Just, you know, in some ways there, it opens up lots of different possibilities that in-person doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so emergent design and, and methodological responsiveness is a literacy. Um, all of this relies on a literacy of research and methods collaboration. And again, Nicole Carl and I think about this concept of dialogic engagement as on a research team, how researchers really share their funds of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And when it's a lone researcher, how do you uh, account for your blind spots and your biases? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to be in systematic dialogue around your research questions, your data collection, your data analysis, your codes, whatever parts of the process you decide, people are in that with you who can challenge you based on social mm -hmm. identity, positionality, role, whatever it may mm -hmm. be. And so collaboration is a foundational literacy of qualitative research. Um, visual, and Jane can talk about this, so I'll, I'll skip the visual and give that to her. I'll just land on participatory, which, Really, the goals of participatory research are about inclusion, and they're about really understanding that everyone is an expert of their own experience and their range of voices, that the collective needs to co-create the conditions mm -hmm. for voice and agency to exist across um, a group. And I would argue as a lot of, um, learning scientists um, with whom I work would argue that actually this kind of screen where everyone is an equal square can actually serve to democratize and even out the visual optic of power in a group. So there are lots of possibilities for participatory and visual to meet in this moment. Uh, and so I'll pass this to Jane to talk about visual literacy and how she sees that literacy being such an important skill for us as researchers. Yeah, I, I was playing around with some language over here and I was thinking about the idea of being translinguistic because I think that part of what we're talking about here in being participatory and collaborative in, the conduct, in, in conducting research is this idea that one of the things that visuals allow us to do is be translinguistic. And it's almost as if we're also, this is going to be a mouthful, transmethodological. So the visuals allow you to really enter into a lot of the different disciplines and modalities through both the methods 
and their ability to communicate themselves. So they're both, a, visual research mm -hmm. is both a method and a tool in all of the other modalities of, of research. Um, and, you know, to add to one of the things that Sharon was saying, this idea of systematic dialogue is enhanced even when you speak the same language, there's a power dynamic that exists. Um, and I think that, you know, researchers like Sharon and like you, Janet, are very aware of this in qualitative work in understanding that, that role that researchers play as listeners. The visuals mm -hmm. um, allow us to be in the same conversation and be co-creating. So there's not mm -hmm. a dynamic of I'm taking the information and you're giving the information, there's a co-creation that can happen through that sort of translinguistic process. So I think in our, our discussion here about research literacies, we hope will motivate those of you who teach or guide researchers to think about the kinds of learning experiences and the kinds of examples you might set that will help emerging researchers to you know, have this kind of more of an open-minded approach where, you know, in the past, you know, some kinds of uh, participatory research only used in studying communities or whatever to say, you know, let's break those down and, and look for ways to use these methods, you know, in whatever kind of research we might be doing. So I want to just add a, a little bit more, you know, thinking in terms of how the visuals can fit into research. And in this um, typology that I developed, specifically thinking about doing research online. And I think, you know, some of these principles relate, you know, whether you are online, in person, or perhaps some of each. To think about, you know, as you were describing the linguistic and kind of going beyond text and words, we can use visuals um, to communicate. So we can transmit them uh, either hand-to-hand -hand or online um, so that we can share ideas and relationships, uh, you know, con complex concepts, you know, in a way that is understandable. But there are other things we can do as well. So we can also um, use visuals to elicit rich uh, responses, either visuals that we've generated or visuals that are um, participants, you know, bring into the study. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, another way that, that uh, visuals can add to our data collection and, and give us both verbal and, and visual, you know, kinds of responses. With the new technologies, we can also navigate. So we can go into games or virtual reality or visually rich environments like, say, a video archive and do participant observation, talk about what we're seeing, ask participants about their impressions and perceptions, et cetera. And then finally, um, we can generate images, we can collaborate. So within the research itself, so methods, creative methods, arts-based methods, performative methods, what I call enacted methods that go beyond uh, having a prompt and a response. So, you know, lots of, of options um, to think about depending on who you're studying and, you know, what kinds of questions you're trying to answer. And these kinds of approaches can be used whether you're doing something that's very structured where you want to get responses to the same visual stimuli or use the same kinds of um, experiences across a varied group of participants or where it's very unstructured, where we're just opening it up and, you know, kind of generating, seeing what comes. So, you know, that I think goes to the inclusiveness, you know, there's not one way. So, you know, we're trying to suggest ideas that, that might, you know, open up for you uh, some new opportunities in your research. Anything else you, either of you would like to add before we close? I'll just say, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. And what I'll say is, as a researcher who did not consider myself particularly adaptive outside of doing participatory work in my international mm -hmm. applied development research, 
I found um, through working with Jane and really seeing how she interprets through the visual, right, which is not the way my brain works, um, in this, you know, in, in a certain sense, is has been revolutionary mm -hmm. for the way that I think about doing what I do and for how I try to support and create the conditions for mm -hmm. my students to learn about multimodal research. And so I've, you know, this past mm -hmm. semester brought in a number of very senior doctoral students who could really talk about multimodal research. And so it revolutionized the way I'm thinking about it before COVID-19. And what I'd like to say is now, I see mm -hmm. even more of a pressing, urgent need mm -hmm. for visualization to cut through the clutter. And one of the things that Jane has taught me is you can really get, if you're doing solutionary research, you can really get the message out in a bunch of different ways using visuals that you mm -hmm. otherwise would not, you know, as an academic, you know, not so much speaking just to other academics all the time, right? Mm -hmm. If I want my, if I want my stuff to get disseminated, used, taken up, if I want resonance, visuals need to be there. And that's a real transformation for me. And I'm really grateful for it. So for those of you listening, who might be a little bit, maybe, you know, hesitant, I was too about a year and a half ago. And it's just been really an amazing learning curve and not as hard or stressful as I thought. So I want to thank you, Jane, for really opening my eyes as a career methodologist to new possibilities for, you know, mm -hmm. not everything doesn't have to be so text focused, right? There are a lot of different ways to message what we're learning. Right. So thank you both. Well, I, I hope that uh, those who are viewing this uh, recording will look for some of the other um, related resources on method space about visual approaches and examples from very uh, creative uh, researchers who are trying out uh, different kinds of uh, ways of using visual interactions, visual data and uh, analysis and look forward to uh, any comments or additions you might suggest.